Parvo is the word that no puppy owner or breeder wants to hear. In this video, I'm gonna cover three things. First, I'm going to talk about how to set yourself up for success to make sure that your puppy or your breeding program does not get Parvo. And as part of that, I'm also going to talk about how to set your home up for an eight to 11 week old puppy. Second, I will talk about what to do if your puppy is having signs and symptoms that could correlate with having parvo. In other words, throwing up and having diarrhea, very uncomfortable. Third, I will be talking about what happens when your vet does say that your puppy has parvo, what to expect, how to set yourself up for success in that situation, and what it costs, what to be prepared for. Here we go. Set yourself up for success and help to make sure your puppy or your breeding program does not experience parvo. Diving in. Parvo is a virus. Like all viruses, think about the flu or COVID. These viruses are not visible and they are very hard to detect. Viruses don't discriminate based on how cute, talented, adorable, wealthy a person is or a puppy. I am Sean Kent Hayashi. I run several businesses. And so when I say that I am a schnauzer breeder, I also am many other things. But for the sake of this video, my background is focused on helping families to have beloved family pets. And so I do a lot of work with puppies and with training those puppies to become wonderful, beloved family members. I aspire to be solutions focused in my life. So I am coming at this topic, this very heavy topic of Parvo and what to do to prevent it. I'm coming at that topic from a very solutions focused place. My goal is not to cast blame on anyone. Instead, it's to help make sure we all have the information that we need to set ourselves and our puppies, our breeding programs up for success. I ask you to join me in this mindset as you listen to my video today. This is not about figuring out who to blame. It's about working together to find a solution that will enable you as a puppy owner or you as a new breeder to have what you need to know so that you can have very healthy puppies. Before getting your new puppy, confirm that the breeder from whom you are getting the puppy has given your puppy the DHPP shot. And potentially even your puppy might have had two rounds of that shot. That would be ideal. My vet has a very clear protocol for giving DHPP shots, and I follow that protocol to a T. I encourage you to connect with your own veterinarian in advance of getting the puppy so that you understand what their protocol is for puppy vaccines, and then tie that into what your breeder has been doing. In other words, you need to understand when that first DHPP shot was given. It might have been somewhere around six, seven, eight weeks of age because that date determines when the next DHPP shot will be due and you want to make sure you keep that schedule current. I go over all of this information with new puppy owners both before they get their puppy. I encourage them to go ahead and get a vet appointment set up for the right dates. And then when they are here to pick up the puppy, I provide them with the vet details, vaccine details, and so forth. On gotcha day, that's the day that people get to pick up their new puppies, I provide 
30 days of free pet insurance through a company called Trupanion. If you are going to use the 30 days of free pet insurance, you need to do so on the day. You need to turn it on on the day that you get your new puppy. You will have a special code that you get from me because I've called into True Panion. I've let them know that you're getting your puppy on this particular day and now we're turning on your insurance coverage for free coverage for 30 days. At the end of the 30 days, you can either elect on your own to keep paying for the pet insurance or you can turn it off. That's up to you. But I highly recommend that you do have some sort of insurance to cover you until your puppy is at least 16 weeks old or you have backup savings in case you need to cover some medical expenses before your puppy is completely vaccinated. In the spirit of setting you and your puppy up for success, another inevitable question that you're going to have is how long after the Parvo vaccine, how long does it take for the puppy to be protected? You're going to find different answers to this question online. But I wanna start with what you're going to find in the UK and in Australia. They use the exact same vaccines that we use here in the United States. However, their protocols are somewhat different. In Australia and the UK, as long as your puppy is 10 weeks old at the time of their DHPP vaccine, they will be immune to distemper, hepatitis, and parvovirus one week after the vaccine. I'll give you below the names of the vaccines that are recommended so you can see how they're spelled because they're slightly different, again, in different parts of the world. So again, one week after the vaccine that's given around the time that the puppy is 10 weeks old. This is called an early finish vaccine in those parts of the world. It's handled differently in the United States. Here in the United States, veterinarians will tell you that you still need an additional vaccine after that one. So the canine parvovirus vaccine typically goes into effect in the body of the dog within three to five days after the vaccine has been given. Some veterinarians will tell you to wait 14 days just to be super safe. One year after the first round of DHPP vaccine, your dog will then need another booster shot and that shot will last three years. So then you'll be on a cycle where every three years, your dog would be getting the DHPP vaccine, or you can titer your dog to find out if you actually need the vaccine. It is not common for a dog that has been vaccinated against the DHPP, distemper, parvo, hepatitis, for them to get those. So you typically don't have to worry about that. Your dog might experience a little bit of flu-like symptoms for a short period of time if they are exposed, however, to a dog that has these, but it wouldn't be life-threatening in the way that it can be if the dog has not been vaccinated. Before a puppy is fully vaccinated, it's possible for it to get parvo. And this is why it is so important to keep your puppy away from areas where parvovirus might be or is clearly there. So what do I mean by that? Well, pet store floors, veterinarian offices floors, dog parks, any place where Dogs that are unknown to you, where you can't confirm that they have had vaccines, you wanna keep your unvaccinated dog away from those areas. So what does that look like? Well, if I'm visiting with friends and people who know what I do, they will sometimes say, hey, can we have a puppy play date, a puppy socialization play date? I want to know that that puppy 
that we might be having a play date with has already had two DHPP vaccines and that there's been a week since that vaccine before that puppy is going to play with any of my puppies and vice versa. I have a whole video series on how to train a playlist on how to train a puppy from eight weeks to 16 weeks. And I talk more about this topic in that playlist. The point that I want to make here though, is it's vital that you socialize your puppy between eight and 16 weeks. So there is a fine line and you have to discover what that is. I'll show you step-by-step step how to do that in that other playlist. Please socialize your puppies. Please don't be afraid. Set yourself up for success. At this point, it's very important for me to share with you that vaccine failures can occur. And this is why I make sure that all of my puppies are vaccinated by a licensed veterinarian. On occasions, you will discover that some breeders, particularly those with lots of dogs, will do their own vaccines from their own kennel, home, wherever they have their dogs. I do not do that and I do not advise that because you can bump into situations where the breeder has not kept the vaccine refrigerated, stored, whatever properly, or has not administered it on the right schedule. So for me and my puppies, they all go to a licensed veterinarian, Quaker Town Vet Clinic, and that is where they are vac vaccinated. The other issue that comes with this is that many veterinarians will not honor a dog that has been vaccinated by a breeder in their own home or their own kennel. So what happens is if you buy a puppy from a breeder who has been doing the vaccines themselves and you take that puppy into your veterinarian, your veterinarian will likely want to start from scratch as if your puppy has had no vaccine. And again, the tricky spot there is you don't want to double up on vaccines. You, you don't want your dog getting multiple or too many vaccines. So pay attention to this. If you are getting a new puppy and your home or the neighborhood around you has had a parvo outbreak in the past, ensure that that puppy has had at least two rounds of, and here's my preference, I want Merck, M-E-R-C-K's DHPP virus shot. It's called Nobivac. It's spelled N-O-B-I-V-A-C. That's the one that's used as an early finish vaccine around the world. Early finish, meaning once the dog has had it at 10 weeks, at 11 weeks, the dog is said to be good. Now, again, that's not always the case here in the United States. You'll still have to have another dose of it, but that's my insurance policy, if you will, for my puppies against parvo distemper hepatitis, the DHPP series. And if you really want the best scenario of all, and you've had a parvo outbreak in your neighborhood, in your home, something like that, and you want another puppy, you wanna add another dog to your family, I highly recommend that you wait until that puppy is at least 16 weeks of age. This is where our puppy prep school program comes into play because dogs that are in our puppy prep school program are with us typically in some time until they're 14, 16 weeks of age and they have then had the three rounds of DHPP shot so that you don't even have to worry about this topic because their vaccines have already kicked in. We're setting your puppy up for success by making sure you know what to do and what not to do. Let me be crystal clear here. When you pick your new puppy up from a breeder, please do not take that puppy to a puppy playground, a pet store, a vet's office and put it on the floor. In fact, when I go into the vet's office, I typically take with me a disposable potty pad 
and I put the disposable potty pad on the weight scale on the exam table. Now, frankly, my vet does that for me now because they, they know how I am about this. And you then throw that disposable uh, potty pad away when you leave the vet's office. So your puppy has never actually touched any surface in the vet's office or in a public playground or pet store. You have carried that puppy and you've seen that the vet has washed their hands, you've washed your hands, anybody touching your puppy has uh, made sure that uh, they have taken care of it, what it takes to get rid of a virus. We'll talk about that here coming up in just a second. Viruses can be transmitted in a wide variety of ways, including on your shoes. So what I mean by this is if you're walking through a pet store and you walk back into your home, you could be carrying parvovirus on your shoes. This is why at my house, we take our shoes off and we don't bring them all the way into the house. This is why at my front door, we have a protocol of having people take their shoes off. Highly recommend that you also become aware of this until the point where your puppy has gotten through that final DHPP vaccine. My unvaccinated puppies are never in the front entrance of my home. They are never in the space in the garage where we are coming in. So unvaccinated puppies in my home environment don't have access to the areas where parvovirus might have landed. Next, I'm going to focus on preparing your home for a puppy that is eight to 11 weeks old. What can you do to get ready before your puppy arrives and then what you can do during that period between eight and 11 weeks? Create a safe playpen for your puppy so that he or she has a place to be, their designated space in your home where you know it's clean, sanitized, and that all is well for your puppy in that space. I have several videos on my channel that show you exactly how to set up a safe playpen. We have multiple playpen areas like this in our home on different floors so that we can rotate our puppies from one playpen area to another. This serves multiple purposes. It enables them to uh, have different, a variety of different experiences throughout the day, but it also enables us to clean, completely clean, sanitize the area that they've been in when they move to the next one. Clorox bleach is the common household cleaner that will kill the parvovirus. You need to follow the directions on the Clorox bleach bottle so that you make sure that whatever ratio you are mixing up works with what you're washing. When we wash our potty pads, towels, anything that has been used by puppies in our washing machine, we set it to the sanitize cycle and we also use bleach when we are cleaning those items. I have cases of these Clorox wipes and we keep them in, we keep this kind of container in all sorts of places throughout the house, the car, any place where um, puppy poop needs to be picked up any time where I need to make sure my hands moving from one thing to another. So Clorox, great. Now I want to introduce you to some other products that will be helpful to you if you're in a really challenging situation. So um, Effervescin is a product. I'll share a little bit more about it. These tablets are for indoor use, and this is made by the same company, the WYSIWASH 
company that has great cleaning products for outdoors. These are quick dissolve and they create a chlorine solution. I called and spoke with Frank from their organization and he was so helpful to me when I needed some additional information about both the effervescent tablets as well as the Wizzy Wash system. He taught me their protocols for both going into high focus on killing the parvovirus in one's home or kennel, as well as their day-to-day -day protocol for sanitizing. One of the things that I really like about this product is I can put one of these tablets in the spray bottle that you can also get from them that has the label on it, put a tablet in, put the water in, let it dissolve, and then you can spray that on surfaces that you might not have been able to spray with bleach. So for example, dog toys, dog food bowls, um, dog play gates, in and out doors, uh, just a wide variety of places. So I've gotten three of those spray bottles that have the label on it so that we know this is the substance in it. And now I can clean the leather seats in my car or the flooring in my car or my um, dog transport carrier, my stroller, things that I probably would not want to stain or discolor by using bleach. When you're using this product or when you're using a bleach solution, spray it on and let it dry. Let it completely dry before you bring a puppy or puppies back into contact with that item. If you're spraying food bowls, the inside of dog crates, the inside of whelping boxes, anything along those lines, you may also want to let it completely dry and then come back and rinse it a time or two before you put puppies back into it so that they're not licking the residue. The Wizzy Wash Company also gave me a link that you can use to order products from Wizzy Wash and they will give you a $10 off. So hopefully that's something that you are able to use if you own a kennel, if you are in a situation where you realize you need to go into hyperdrive mode. These two systems work really beautifully together and use the link below. My conversation with Frank was very helpful to me. He also taught me two things that I did not know. When you are working with chlorine-based cleaning products to sanitize, do not use organic material. In other words, use a microfiber cloth or a microfiber mop, but not a cotton cloth or mop. The cotton or the organic material, such as a paper towel, actually diminishes the effectiveness of the cleaning solution because of the chemistry going on. The chlorine is bonding. You want the chlorine to bond to the virus and pull it out rather than having it bond to the cotton or something along those lines. Thus, keep microfiber rags and mops with bleach-related, chlorine-related products. The second thing he taught me that I did not know is when you mix up this type of product into a spray bottle, as soon as you're finished, put that spray bottle into a dark environment and it will not last past about seven days. So what I mean by that is when I put a, a tablet of this into the spray bottle and I spray it on whatever I'm spraying it on, let's say this door over here, I wouldn't leave that spray bottle then sitting next to this door where it's going to be in the bright light because that will break down 
the ability for the liquid to do its job. Instead, I need to store it in a dark place for up to seven days. My practice is probably going to be that just every Sunday we change the liquid in these bottles regardless and that we keep them in dark environments in between uses. In some of my other videos about setting your puppy up for success, I have very specific guidance on how to use the Wizzy Wash system to prepare your backyard or patio. In fact, we have a habit and have long had a habit of Wizzy Washing our back patio where our older dogs go. But our young puppies, our young puppies don't go out there. So if we have puppies that have not yet been vaccinated, they are not going outside hanging out in grass or on a patio, etc. even if it's been whizzy washed. Now the whizzy wash helps break down all kinds of things, sanitizes, so parvovirus is a part of what whizzy wash focuses on, but it also is really great with other things, mold, just all the stuff you wouldn't want on your patio or in your backyard that your dogs would be exposed to. Now we're at the second part that I promised you I would focus on. What to do if your puppy is throwing up, has diarrhea, or other signs and symptoms related to the parvovirus. Throwing up and diarrhea in a puppy can be a sign, a symptom of multiple different things, including giardia, coccidia, and parvo. You don't want to hear any of those, but the one you really don't want to hear is parvo. If these symptoms are occurring in a puppy that has not had two rounds of the DHPP vaccine, then I highly recommend you immediately take your puppy to a veterinarian. Call the veterinarian's office on the way Call the emergency vet if you need to use a backup emergency vet, evenings, weekends, something like that. Let them know that you are on your way. Most likely they are going to want to do, and you should ask for a SNAP test. You want a SNAP Parvo test, a SNAP Giardia test, and a SNAP Coccidia test. You want that administered from your car. You see, like my veterinarian, if someone calls in and says, hey, I'm coming in with a puppy that's throwing up or has diarrhea, they're going to do those tests from the car so that we're not bringing this very contagious puppy into the veterinarian's office. If your veterinarian's office is like mine, in this situation, they will be grateful that you called ahead to tell them you were coming and they will have probably two vet techs ready to come out to your car. These vet techs will be covered in, mm, I'll call it virus protection. Uh, they'll have on uh, like hazmat looking clothing so that they've got gloves, they've got hats, coverage, because if this is a parvovirus, it is highly contagious and your vet's office will need to do everything they can to protect the rest of the vet's office and your puppy will go into quarantine if your puppy is diagnosed with parvovirus. If your puppy is diagnosed with Giardia or Coccidia, other things will happen, but it is not as severe. I have other videos on those topics. Now we're at the portion of the video where I'm going to be talking about what to do, what to expect, and what it costs when your vet says, your puppy has parvo. I have been around dogs and had dogs living in my home. I have been an avid dog lover all my life since I was a very young girl. Again, I tell the story of that in other places on my channel, but for the sake of this video, what I want you to know is that this now becomes a very personal story. I had never had a vet say to me, your puppy or this puppy has parvo until recently. Here's what happened. 
I purchased a puppy from another breeder to add to my own breeding program. And when I do that, I typically like to bring in a sibling so that that puppy is in a comfortable little cocoon and it makes the transition much easier. So I purchased an eight week old puppy to be sent with a sibling and I had a pet nanny pick up those two puppies in an airport in another state and bring them here. They were in my home in quarantine, if you will, for several days while I checked to make sure that we were in good shape. What I did not understand at that time was that the incubation period for Parvo is a little longer than I understood. Now there are mixed data points on this that you will find online and that you will hear from different vets. But what I have seen with the scientific research is that the incubation period from the time a dog is exposed to parvo until the time that it starts showing signs and symptoms is somewhere between eight and 14 days. What does that mean? If a puppy's exposed to parvo, the virus, about eight to 14 days later, signs and symptoms will start showing up. The breeder had done some parvo shots on these puppies, but this particular breeder, I believe, had probably done those parvo shots herself, meaning I'm not sure that those puppies went to a licensed veterinarian to have their shots. First lesson learned, Sean, I will not make that mistake again. I will ensure before I get a puppy from another breeder that it has had the parvovirus shots given by a veterinarian. One week after I got those two puppies, they went to my veterinarian to get their DHPP vaccine, which would have been potentially their second or third parvo vaccine. The very first time that I admitted to myself that there was an issue really was right after that vaccine was given. On the way home from the vaccine, the little boy threw up in the car. It was not at that point that I thought we had a problem. It's not uncommon for a puppy to throw up in the car. It's not uncommon for a puppy to have a mild reaction. A little later, several hours later, that puppy threw up again. Now I'm starting to think something's off. So I called my veterinarian and spoke directly with him. He said to me it was likely a vaccine reaction. We were both in agreement, no problem. We went into action based on that. The next morning, that puppy threw up again and was now starting to show some signs of diarrhea. I again called the veterinarian and luckily was able to speak directly with him. We both thought this was still just as an extreme reaction to the vaccine itself. And so the veterinarian recommended a tablet that helps to ease uh, pain, so forth. And we did that. When that didn't seem to be working either, I then immediately took the puppy in and we treated the puppy, the veterinarian treated the puppy with IV fluids and things to help the puppy respond to a vaccine reaction. My veterinarian called the manufacturer of the drug, talked about what had happened, some conversations around that, I believe, took place. It was later that day, that night, where the thought was, let's test for some other things here. What else might be going on? And that's when the SNAP test for coccidia, giardia, and parvo was done. 
this puppy did not have Giardia or Coccidia. Unfortunately, this puppy, we heard the word we don't ever want to hear. This puppy has parvo. None of us that were involved with this puppy or even my medical team at, at Quakertown Vet Hospital had any reason to suspect that this puppy had parvo. I've never experienced parvo. I am meticulous in the way that I take care of my puppies. So this came as a huge shock to me. Uh, I have just never imagined that I would be in this situation. But this is why, uh, you may remember in the opening of this video, I mentioned it's so important to stay in a mindset that doesn't jump to blaming and that doesn't jump to uh, wanting someone else to be at fault here. I have to, and I had to stay in the mindset of how do we create a solution? How do we go into immediate action to help this puppy live through this horrible virus? So what do the symptoms of parvo really look like? Well, I want to give you a warning, if you will, before I show this next part of the video. If you have a sensitive stomach, fast forward a few seconds here, but I'm going to show you what a puppy that has parvo, who's just begun, in essence, the having the symptoms, what it looks like when they're throwing up. And this is what that same puppy looked like two hours before throwing up like that. There is a stigma with Parvo that it mm, primarily or only comes from puppy mills. And I too have had that kind of thought, belief up to this point. But in order to solve this problem, I have to get beyond that thought pattern. You see, I myself have kept my property, my home, my dogs very clean. And I've had strict protocols here within my own home about how we handle our dogs and what it's like when visitors come. Anytime that we've had unvaccinated puppies here, if you've been a visitor in our home, you know what we go through. Shoes off, hands washed, all the things that we need to do to ensure that those puppies are healthy. That is our number one priority. So frankly, I was beyond stunned. I was devastated when I realized that I had two puppies who were diagnosed with parvo in my own home. Whew. I can't even tell you what pain and stress that was for me and my family. I want to be in integrity with you about what the experience was for me and my family, and what will be happening, what we will be changing as a result of this experience. I will be making some changes in my own practices as a dog breeder from the learning that I've had here. I've long time had a motto that I live by, and it goes something like this. You're either winning or you're learning. And I've been doing a lot of learning this past week. The first thing that I will change is that any dog, any puppy that comes to my property from somewhere else will have had at least two rounds of DHPP vaccine and there will have been at least a week time 
between when that last DHPP vaccine was given and when that puppy arrives on my property. This means that puppies that were not born here on my property will be at least 11 weeks old before they arrive here. I will ensure that all areas in my home where mom dogs and unvaccinated puppies are will be cleaned, sanitized, and at the highest level of protection just right away, immediately. Now, we were already doing that before. We've never had an issue with our puppies, but I'm going to be hyper-focused on this now in a way I've never been before. I may have four females who are currently pregnant. And most likely, if they are pregnant, they would be having puppies in August. There are several things that will be happening here in my home between now and August, normally to prepare for those puppies arrival, but it will be even more uh, intense. If any puppy here has signs of diarrhea, throwing up, they will immediately be taken to the emergency vet and we will have those three SNAP tests that I mentioned previously. Parvo, coccidia, and giardia done immediately so that we make sure we are treating the right thing if that happens. I will do anything that I am able to do to ensure that my puppies and my dogs are thriving. The primary source of this virus comes from the feces or throw up of infected dogs. The virus begins to be shed in the feces of the infected dog before the symptoms start to show up. And after a puppy has been treated, the shedding can still occur for up to two weeks. Dogs that have not been properly vaccinated can get the vax or can get the, the parvovirus by coming into contact with or ingesting the virus. Thus, keeping all of my puppies and dogs away from this virus is my intention, my goal. Jim and I have some friends who also happen to have one of our dogs. And uh, one of the great things about them, they owned a company that specializes in cleaning up after pharmaceutical or bio waste. Uh, they go into companies, organizations, and their business cleans up any kind of hazard area. And so we are connecting with them, talking to them, intending to work with their company to ensure that our home, the area where the puppies were, is sanitized at that level of clean. That's right, we're intending to do a medical grade level of cleanup in the areas where those two puppies were both before they were diagnosed with parvo and for the two weeks once they came home. Also, those puppies never went outside. They were never in the grass or the yard at my home. They were never in my back patio area. They were in the grass for a few moments at the home of some friends of ours, but they didn't go potty in that grass and it was only a very small space. So we will of course be talking to them about what might need to be done in that very small area of grass where they were placed for a few minutes. For those of you who want to know what it costs, what's the dollar amount associated with having a vet hospital treat Parvo? I'm going to show you that. My hope is that by seeing this bill, it will be inspiration for you as a potential new puppy owner, or if you already have a new puppy, and if you are thinking about being a dog breeder, or if you are a new dog breeder, 
please let this bill serve you as inspiration to take action to do the right things so that you don't ever have to see a vet bill like this one. Yeah, that's right. You understood that bill correctly. Ugh. This is a difficult life learning lesson for me. Fortunately, I can hear my doggies playing here in the background. Perhaps you hear them playing too. And it reminds me that there are good things in life and to pick my head up and to keep going. Quakertown Vet Clinic is both a full service veterinary practice as well as an emergency hospital. And they have a commitment. They strive to provide excellent care to all of their patients. They have hundreds of people on staff and they are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I am extremely grateful for Quakertown Vet Hospital for their support, their expertise, their guidance, their direction uh, through what was an extremely stressful period of time for me and my family. There was one point in this where Jim and I were standing in the kitchen and Jim just said, the stress of this is so intense. I tried to wait to make sure that uh, before I did this video, I wasn't going to cry, but I just want you to know this was very hard and extremely stressful period of time uh, for us over several days dealing with the reality. The reality was we knew that these two puppies could pass and as we talked to our vet regularly each day, initially they were offering no hope and uh, really no sense of possibility that uh, these puppies would recover. And that was just devastating to us because under no circumstance do I, Jim, any, any of us here want to do anything that would cause a puppy to be in a situation of less than thriving. Given what I do, it is so important to me to have a very strong relationship with the vets that I work with. I have to have a partnership with my vet office in order to run my business the way that I do. It is vital to me to have their expertise. I am not a vet. I do not have the training in the science uh, to cure or to even handle a lot of the things that I am faced with as a dog breeder. And so if you are a new dog breeder, please make sure you do your homework to find a great vet, to have a veterinarian office and an emergency backup if that primary vet is not also an emergency vet. So just a big, huge shout out and thank you to Quakertown Vet Hospital and to all of you who work there. Now, I also need to add something. Like all human systems, like all teams, not everybody that works there agrees or shares the same information. So there were a couple of times along the way in this where I felt like I was hearing sort of one thing from one person, but maybe something slightly different or nuanced from another. And I'm one of those people who pays really close attention to those kinds of things. So I like to learn. I like to learn while I am going through a life experience. And so I ask a lot of questions to say, help me learn from this. Help me understand this. To ensure that I am being transparent and in integrity with you, I want to share with you that one of the veterinarians told me that I should not bring a new dog, any new dog, onto my property for at least five years. When I heard that, I was in shock. She also initially told me that having puppies was completely out of the question and that under no circumstances should I have puppies here in my home and that if I had dogs that had been bred, I should make arrangements for them to be uh, having their puppies somewhere else. Again, I, just hearing this was devastating. I thought about this and deeply considered the options. Thought through, if I, if I do this option, what happens, then what, then what, then what? If I do this option, what happens, then what, then what, then what? And I had a couple of sleepless nights. And then I woke up one morning and it clicked with me. 
I have, for many years, had a great relationship with Quakertown Vet Hospital. And when my puppies are being born, I often will take mom dog in and be in one of the rooms at Quaker Town. We have a set up a relationship where when my mom dog goes into labor, if I feel like anything's in question at all, I can bring mom dog in and Jim and I, we bring blankets or they provide us with blankets. We sit on the floor and we let mom dog whelp those puppies with us right there so that if we need help, we've got it immediately. Now we don't always do that. We only do that in situations where um, there might be something going on. Maybe an x-ray has revealed that uh, we need to be aware of something. But those puppies, when they have been born at Quakertown Hospital have been just fine. Every puppy that we have had within the first day, two days of its life has gone into Quakertown Hospital for vets to examine it. We have tails docked, we have dew claws removed. The puppy is at Quakertown Vet. When the puppy is several weeks old, it goes in for exams and shots. It goes in before it's been vaccinated, you see, because it goes there to be vaccinated. Where is it going? It's going into an environment that frequently has dogs that have highly contagious. So I found myself saying, well, what is it that Quakertown Vet or others are doing that's causing them to feel comfortable to say to me, bring very vulnerable puppies in to be treated? And whatever it is that they're doing that is enabling them to feel confident with that, I can do too. I can do that too in my home. And so this is why I have a learning curve in front of me. If Quakertown Vet Clinic can figure out how to clean their property, their rooms, their examining areas, so that they're comfortable having my puppies come on site, then I can figure it out too. And so I'm not going to let fear stop me from moving forward. Instead, I'm going to say thank you so much to the veterinarian who said this to me. Thank you for challenging me. Thank you for suggesting that I wait five years before I bring a new puppy onto my property or before I have puppies. That was a wake up call for me that I need, I was already taking it very seriously, but this is so important to me, the work that I am doing and I am committed to figuring this out. So those of you who've been on this journey with me for a while watching what I'm doing here, I thank you for being on the path with me and I'm going to continue on this path figuring out how to do this in a best practice way. If you are a veterinarian or an experienced dog breeder and you have some comments or some suggestions about anything I've said in this video, please feel free to comment about your experience in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. If you have some developmental feedback for me or criticism for me, I would appreciate any data fact-based information that you could share that would help me as I continue to have a commitment to do the best thing for my puppies and my dogs and to create beloved family pets. This video will be a part of two different playlists on my channel. One of the playlists is setting your puppy up for success. And the other playlist is a day in the life of a dog breeder. So again, if you're getting a new puppy and you want to set your puppy up for success, watch the playlist, setting your puppy up for success. If you are new to dog breeding or would like inspiration as a peer colleague, uh, please consider watching the playlist, A Day in the Life of a Dog Breeder. And now what I'm going to show you are some video clips that I took along the way as we were going through this. Just to tie it all together, here's the visual that comes with much of what I've been talking about. And look who's home. Look who's home and happy. His tail is wagging. 
<laughs> We're so happy that you're home. There are several things you'll need to be prepared to do when you bring your puppy home from the hospital having had parvo. When your puppy's released to you, they will tell you that you have about two weeks where your puppy will likely be shedding the vaccine. So you need to keep your puppy in a very controlled area. They'll also suggest to you that you have clothing that you wear when you are going in to interact with and pet the puppy. So I have that here and I change into that here and we handle footwear very carefully, making sure that uh, bleach is, um, these, the bleach wipes are on the bottom of the shoes if I'm wearing shoes in, otherwise I just wipe my feet. So we go in and we play with him regularly and then we make sure that all the clothing, everything that could be shedding virus um, is uh, cleaned. You'll also see the meds that he is on. So I will show you what that looks like. So I create my own little cheat sheet for the day with the times and I set the times into my alarms so that when the alarm goes off, I know that I need to be uh, taking care of something regarding his meds. And the good news is his little sister will be released most likely either today or tomorrow. And so you're gonna be so happy to have her back, aren't you? Aren't you? Yes. These are the discharge instructions for the little boy who was able to be released first. And these are the medications and the schedule that he is on this is the five page bill that resulted from the little boy's visit. The boy was released before the girl and so I have his, his information. This is the cost of treating the little boy for Parvo. Yes, that's correct. What I'm telling you is that I personally paid $7,843.55 for this little boy to be uh, healed. And what wasn't included in the bill is a case of this food, which we'll be feeding him for the next week or so. We also hope to be feeding her the same thing when she gets home, hopefully very soon. This is the Wizzy Wash system that can be used outside for getting rid of viruses, parvo, it's sanitizing, deodorizing. The capsules come in these in this tub like this, and you put the capsule into the inside here, and you use your own hose to spray your patio yard and so forth. It also comes with this owner's manual that walks you through step by step what to do, how to do it. This company, Wizzy Wash, is also the creator of Effervescent, which is the product that can be used indoors. And here's what it looks like. I've gotten several of these spray bottles so that I can have them in multiple places in my home. They will be stored in dark areas and exchange the liquid every seven days. Again, everything here, bleach, disinfected, everything. My husband, Jim, uh, stayed up for hours mopping, uh, doing everything that needed to be done. And when one of the dog beds comes out of the washing machine dryer, we bring it back and put it in here. This is the laundry room in the morning, meaning we've already been doing lots of the laundry, lots of the potty pads and such, because every one of them we are doing again. We always hit the sanitize button on the washing machine and we add Clorox bleach into the section here. All the soft toys are here yet to be washed and then they'll go in the dryer this time. Normally I let them air dry, but I think under these circumstances with the bleach 
and maybe I'll put them in the dryer, we'll see, but you'll see today, this is dog bed washing and everything. We're literally, these will get soaked in bleachy water. More just showing you, even the mop has been wiped down with the Clorox. And I soaked all these toys overnight in a solution of water and Clorox. So now I will rinse them extremely well and perhaps let the puppy have some of them to play with. I know she would like some toys. Every surface mopped, wiped down at least once with bleach, sprayed, <sighs> lots of work. And the laundry pile keeps growing. I didn't realize I had so many dog beds scattered throughout my home in different little play areas. And again, at no point did we have the puppies in or around these chairs. So the little guy uh, just never had the opportunity to be in this space in my home. So I'm not so worried about wiping down the leather and this area while he certainly was in this area over here all of this has now been bleached every area that he was in has been wiped down we already had the protocol in place to pick poop up with toilet paper and or clorox and put it in here we cleaned this as well and we also have these air filters in multiple places in the house that are set to uh, German virus level. So they do a really good job, I think, of uh, helping the air quality in our home and around our dogs. We also already had a protocol to regularly whizzy wash our back patio area for the dogs and Wizzy wash has a claim on it that uh, it eliminates things like giardia and parvo again we've never had a problem like this before so this is a first time for us and there's a lot of learning going on here but i feel like many of our protocols such as the Wizzy wash protocol were already in the right direction doing the right thing even our dishwasher has been put into use sanitizing all of our bowls and dog food dishes. So these pie plates that I feed my dogs in regularly and uh, these little plates that I feed dogs on, all of it sanitized. Getting ready to whizzy wash all of these surfaces. Hours and hours of laundry have been done today, but we're getting really close to having it wrapped up. So I've just picked up the little girl from Quaker Town Vet Hospital, and I wanted to show you the bill and the kinds of things that were done for her. So during this experience, I was regularly having conversations with veterinarians about what they were doing, including fecal transplants on both the little boy and the little girl. But you can see these were the services that she received over the time that she was in the hospital. And parvo is a frightening thing to experience, but here's the final number on her. So you can understand this has been an extremely expensive week for me. These are the discharge instructions for the little girl. And you can see here the medications and when they are due. So there's quite a bit of work once puppies come home from being in the hospital. 
Getting the puppies to eat normal puppy food, oh my goodness, just impossible. This is what I have found that they will consistently eat. So they are eating grass-fed ground beef, and that's how I'm able to get these meds, pills, etc., into them. So here is a reunion. They're back. They've made it. Everybody here is ecstatic. Parvo is the word no puppy owner and no dog breeder wants to hear. <sighs> Fortunately, both puppies made it through and are going to thrive.